Welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about the symmetric group. Now you may be thinking, we've already talked about the symmetric group, Ben. That would be S sub n, right? Where this is the set of all permutations of the set 1, 2, 3, etc., all the way up to n, right? n symbols. The symmetric group on n symbols. We have already talked about this, but the symmetric group is really important theoretically and practically in groups. Um, it's probably the most important single group, and there's much more to say about it that hasn't already been said. So being one-to-one -one and onto, the elements of this group are all bijections, or we have previously called them permutations. All right, now some new notation. Let m1, m2, all the way up to mk be elements of I sub n. That is, let them be in the set 1, 2, all the way up to n, with of course k being less than or equal to n, other that, or otherwise that would be nonsensical. Now what we're going to do is we're going to write m1, m2, m3, etc., all the way up to mk, and we're going to put it in parentheses. And this is going to represent a certain permutation in our group, namely the one you get when you send m1 to the place of m2, m2 to the place of m3, m3 to the place of m4, and etc., all the way up to m sub k minus 1 to m sub k, and then we're going to send m sub k back to the place of m sub 1. So for example, we could write, uh, let, let's consider i4, and then if we were to write uh, 1, 3, 4 in parentheses, this would mean that we send under our mapping 1 to 3, 3 to 4, and 4 to 1. And that is going to be our permutation. The example I just showed you was that of a 3 cycle, 1, 3, 4, because it has 1, 2, 3 elements in there, right? And in general, we call these k cycles or cycles of length k. This is the shorter version. And in fact, two cycles actually have a special name. We're going to call those transpositions. You transpose two elements. Something you might have already noticed about these k cycles is that m1, m2, all the way to mk is the same as m2 all the way to mk, then m1 is the same as m3 to m1, m2, and etc. So that so long as you do it in the same cyclical order, it's really the same k cycle, which shouldn't be a huge surprise. Now, these k cycles all have an inverse cycle, as you would expect, because they're group elements of the symmetric group. So, m1, etc., inverse is going to be equal to, well, it's going to be equal to the cycle which undoes it, right? If, if we send, you know, if we visualize this again, if we send this dot to this dot, and this one to this one, you know, etc., then the inverse cycle is going to be the cycle which sends everything back to the left right back to its original position so this is going to be equal to mk mk minus 1 all the way to m1 right so we just reversed the order and that's the inverse cycle which we could also write because of this property as m1 in front times mk m sub k minus 1 etc all the way down to m sub 2 if you like Now when we speak of cycles, we often use cycle notation. Let me demonstrate what this is. So before we had uh, our cycle, our three cycle, one, three, four, uh, which is in S4, right? Acting on the set one, two, three, four. 
And what we're gonna do is we're gonna write out one, two, three, four. So just the elements of I4. And then below each element, we're gonna show which one that maps to. It's very intuitive. So one, according to our cycle notation, goes to three. So we'll write a three here. Two, it doesn't mention it, so it goes straight back to two. Three goes to four, so put a little four there. And then four goes back to one, so we'd write a one there. And we call this cycle notation, where we always have two rows. The first row is our set, and the second row is vertically what that set is mapping to. So it's a good way to visualize um, permutations. Now the great virtue of cycle notation is that it's really easy to see how to multiply elements of the symmetric group. Now remember, each element of the symmetric group is a bijection from this set to itself, which means that we're actually composing mappings to do our multiplication, if you'll recall. And it's very easy to do with this. So suppose we have another, uh, another one, let's do, do one, two, three, four, and just how about one, one, two, four, three, right? So it's gonna be the permutation which switches those two elements. Now it's very easy to see what, what we get out of this. We just go one to three. So one to three, three to four. So one goes to four under the composition. Two goes to two, then two goes to two. So two gets mapped to two. Three goes to four, four goes to three. So we get three, and four goes to one, and one goes to one. So four goes to one in the product permutation. We see that these two uh, permutations multiply to, to this permutation. And in fact, we can write that in this notation as one, three, four times, what is this? Three, four is equal to one, four product of permutations done easily. Now something else I'd like to draw your attention to is the non-commutativity of the symmetric group in general. So obviously S2 is commutative because it's isomorphic to Z2, but in general Sn is not commutative, it's not an abelian group, and this cycle notation makes it really easy to demonstrate this. So for instance, You'll notice this is the same as this, and this is the same as this. So we're, we're testing is AB equal to BA. This is just for S4. So one goes to two, two goes to one. So I'll have one goes to one. Two goes to three, three goes to four. So two goes to four. Three to one, one to three, well, th three goes to three. And four goes to four, and four goes to two. So four goes to two. Now, in this product, we have one to three, three to one, so one goes to one again. Two goes to one, two, uh, one goes to two, so two goes to two. Three goes to four, four goes to four, so three goes to four, and four goes to two, and two to three, so four goes to three. And you notice that this is not, in fact, the same permutation as that one. So we see that our SN is indeed a non-abelian group, which is going to make it harder to study. However, even though SN is not in general abelian, some permutations may commute with some other permutations. So what we want to ask is what is the condition for commutativity between two permutations? And it's going to exactly be this. So let sigma and tau be two elements of S sub n, two permutations, and what we want to say is when is sigma tau equal to tau sigma? And just keep in mind this multiplication once again is map composition. So turns out what we need is a notion of disjointness. So we're going to call a disjoint permutation, uh, two disjoint permutations, or even a set of disjoint permutations, are going to mean precisely this. Sigma of m is not equal to m implies 
that tau of m is equal to m and tau of m is not equal to m implies sigma of m is equal to m and this is going to be for all m in the set i sub n right which our permutations are mapping to itself so what is this saying well it's saying that if we have our set one all the way up to n then if we pick some random element in here let's say two then if sigma switches two with another element in there then tau does not it leaves two invariant the same thing for tau if tau were to switch one with another element then sigma would not be allowed to move that other element so it may not be obvious how this implies this but it should be pretty clear that this is a sufficient condition for commutativity and you'll have to take it on my word this time that indeed this is an if and only if a biconditional statement that if you have two elements of the group sn which are commuting then you're going to have this relationship where they do not touch they do not switch the same elements of the set i spin and of course this generalizes pretty easily to a set of permutations so if you had sigma one sigma two to sigma k all in s sub n then you would have the same relationship right so you would have if sigma if sigma i of m is not equal to m then sigma sub j of m is equal to m for all j which are not equal to i right so if one of these switches sends two to three then all the others sends two to two with all that notation and terminology out of the way we are now ready for our first theorem so without further ado every non-identity permutation in the symmetric group on n symbols is uniquely up to the order of the factors a product of disjoint cycles of length greater than or equal to two and this little uh bit at the end is just because a one cycle would just be the permu the identity permutation so and we're saying this is a non-identity permutation by supposition so there's nothing special going on there we can break every permutation down into a product of disjoint cycles all right some of the proofs this time are going to be doozies so i'm going to give you an overview first what is our overarching goal here we're going to pick some permutation, some random permutation in S sub n, and we're going to define an equivalence relation, um, which I'll just call squiggly here, on the set 1, 2, to n, which this element sigma is acting on. We're going to define an equivalence relation, prove that it's an equivalence relation, um, on this set and it's going to be relative to our element we choose then we are going to show that um, that in fact the action on one equivalence class action of Sigma on an equivalence class which we'll call X bar is a cycle of length K it's a K cycle then finally, we're going to show that because an equivalence relation partitions the set, that we can actually partition it into equivalence classes. So partition one, two, etc., into disjoint equivalence classes and write sigma as product, I'll just use pi for product here, of disjoint cycles. So we're gonna, we're gonna define this equivalence relation and prove that it is such. We're going to show that the action of our permutation on an equivalence um, class is a cycle. And then we're gonna use the fact that all equivalence relations partition sets into disjoint equivalence classes to write uh, sigma as a composition of maps on each of those uh, equivalence 
classes. And then each of those is going to be a cycle by part two, so we can write sigma as a product of disjoint cycles as planned. Get ready. All right, proof. So let sigma be an arbitrary permutation in symmetric group on n symbols um, with x and y elements of our permuted set 1, 2, 2, n. We called this i n before. And now define this relation x relation y if and only if there exists some integer k such that y is sigma to the power k of x, which is to say that if we apply the permutation to the set k times in succession, that x will get mapped to y. Now let's show that this is an equivalence relation. So you recall the three properties of equivalence relations, which you should know well by now. So we're going to have uh, first, I want to show that x always uh, relation to x. X is always uh, equivalent to x. So to show this, it's very simple. Sigma to the zero, where zero is our k, is uh, going to be the identity map because this is just always true. Therefore, uh, sigma to the zero of x is equal to identity of x is equal to x and therefore x is equivalent to x. That's exactly what we want. And this is true for arbitrary x in our set 1 to n. Okay, now second property of equivalence relations. We want to show that x equivalent to y implies y equivalent to x. So we're going to suppose x is equivalent to y, right? Then there exists k in the integers such that sigma to the k of x is equal to y, right? This is just our definition. Now we're going to use our knowledge of cyclic groups. So we know that the subgroup generated, the cyclic subgroup generated by our permutation sigma is some subgroup of s sub n. And we know that since s sub n is finite, so is this cyclic subgroup. And we showed before that this means that sigma, the cyclic group generated by sigma is isomorphic to ZL since it's finite for some L in the integers, in the positive integers specifically. <laughs> now we also know from our time studying cyclic groups that L is the least positive integer such that sigma to the L is equal to the identity mapping, right? Or we can call this um, with our new notation just uh, one, right? This is our identity permutation. So this is going to come in handy in the following way. All right, so we know that sigma to the L minus K of sigma to the K of X has to be equal to sigma to the L minus K of Y because sigma to the K of X is equal to Y. We already said that. But of course, if you compose these, this is just going to be sigma to the L minus K plus K is equal to sigma to the L of X so that we have sigma to the L of X is equal to sigma to the L minus K of Y. Now, since L is the smallest positive integer such that sigma to the L is the identity map, this is just X. So that X is equal to sigma to the L minus K of Y. And since L minus K is in the integers, there does exist an integer such that X is equal to sigma to that integer of y, so thus we have the rela y relation x, y is equivalent to x as we wanted to show. All right, we're almost done with the first part. 
So now we have to show that x equivalent to y and y equivalent to z implies that x is equivalent to z. So if we suppose this, then there exists integers k1 and k2 such that y is equal to sigma applied k1 times to x and z is equal to sigma applied k2 times to y. Thus, by composition, z is equal to sigma k2 of sigma k1 of x, and because of the way um, composition of mappings work, this is equivalent to sigma to the k1 plus k2 applications of, of sigma on x, so that uh, there does exist an integer such that this repeated application of this to x gives you z, and namely that integer is k1 plus k2. So therefore, z is, or rather, x is equivalent to z after all. And we have that this thing is an equivalence relation, as we want it. On to part two. All right, now we want to show that restricted to an equivalence class defined by our equivalence relation, any permutation sigma is going to act as a cycle on that equivalence class. So suppose we have an equivalence class x, x bar rather. So this is going to be a set of all y in 1, 2, up to n, such that sigma to the k of x is equal to y for some integer k. Right? An equivalence class. All right. Now we know that there exists an m, an integer m, such that sigma to the m of x is equal to x, such that m is minimal. Now, m is also the minimal positive integer for which sigma to the m is equal to, of y is equal to y, for all y in the equivalence class of x. For if not, suppose that there exists another integer, let's call it p, such that p is positive but smaller than m, strictly, and sigma to the p of y is equal to y for some y in the equivalence class of x. Since y is in the equivalence class of x, we know that there exists q, an integer, such that y is equal to sigma to the q of x. Thus, this statement reduces to sigma to the p of sigma to the q of x is equal to sigma to the q of x, right? Well, this side can just be called sigma to the p plus q of x is equal to sigma to the q of x. And thus we can apply sigma to the negative q, right, the inverse q times to both sides to get this, because the mapping commutes with itself, of x is equal to sigma to the negative q of sigma to the q of x. And this is going to reduce to the identity map, and this outside part is also going to be the identity map, giving us that sigma applied p times to x gives you x. But of course, this is a contradiction since we assumed that m was the minimal positive integer such that it maps x to itself. So we know that there is no such integer p, and that m is the least positive integer for which all elements in the equivalence class of x get mapped back to themselves through repeated permutation. Now, why does this matter? Because this is exactly the action of a k-cycle, or rather an m-cycle if we're going to use the same notation. So, in our, uh, our usual notation, let's say x1, x2, all the way to xm, we said m was the uh, least positive integer for which it cycles, right? So if you apply x1 to xm, 
over and over again. Let's just do it down here. It's X1 to XM. If we do this M times, what will happen? Well, we're gonna have X1 go to X2. Then we're gonna have X2 go to X3 all the way to um, X sub N minus one to X sub M back to X1. So that no matter where you start on this, for instance, X is, so one goes to two, two goes to three. But if you do it M times, you're gonna have X1 go back to X1. Similarly with X2, you're gonna have X2 go back to X2 and it's gonna be the identity permutation. So what you know is that repeating an M cycle M times gives you the identity permutation. And this is how exactly we know that our action of our permutation sigma on uh, on uh, the equivalent equivalence class X if you just restrict its domain from 1 to n just to the equivalence class of our element X then we know that it is acting as a an M cycle a K cycle where K is equal to M so now part 3 let X1 bar X2 bar all the way up to XR bar for some positive integer R be the partition of 1 to n induced by the equivalence relation squiggly whatever you want to call it now we know by the definition of a partition and by equivalence classes that our set uh, i sub n is equal to the union from i equals 1 to r of these equivalence classes x sub i bar. So now if we call sigma sub i equal to sigma only with the re domain restricted to the equivalence class of x sub i, then we know that sigma can be written as sigma 1 on uh, for x in x1 bar, sigma 2 for x in x2 bar, all the way up to sigma r for x in xr bar. And since these form a partition of i sub n, then this, can, this uh, stitching together of our mappings constitutes a complete function, which is our permutation sigma on i sub n. So now we can extend the domain to where sigma i is equal to, well, just what it was before, maybe we should say look squiggly, sigma, sigma i uh, tilde is equal to sigma i for x in x i bar, and it's gonna be equal to just the identity permutation for x not in x i bar. Then we can write our permutation sigma as a product or composition if you like, from i equals 1 to r of our sigma i squigglies here. And notably, because of our disjoint equivalence classes, if sigma sub i, let's see, if sigma sub i of, we'll say m again for, for our earlier notation, is not equal to m, then we know that sigma j, this implies that sigma j of m is equal to m. And we know this because our different uh, constituent, constituent cycles here are actually acting on different part, parts of the partition, different uh, subsets, different equivalence classes rather is the word I'm looking for. So this condition is automatically satisfied and we already knew that this implies commutativity. So this is our disjoint cycle uh, condition so that what we have is our, finally, our permutation sigma can be written as a product of disjoint cycle permutations. So let sigma be a permutation and let tau sub i indexed by this capital I indexing set, which is 
finite, uh, be a family of permutations in S sub n. Now, if sigma and sigma inverse are disjoint, this is its group element, right? Sigma inverse, then sigma is the identity permutation. And two, if sigma and tau sub i are disjoint for each i, then so are sigma and the product uh, of the family of permutations here. We're going to need this for a big theorem in a sec. All right, for part one, let's assume that they're disjoint and then derive a contradiction. So, um, let i and j be i, j be an i sub n, and let sigma of i be equal to j. Then by definition, sigma inverse of j is equal to i. But since they're disjoint, sigma of i equals j um, implies that sigma inverse of i is equal to i. Now this is going to be a problem because sigma inverse then, or rather sigma of sigma inverse of i is going to be equal to sigma of i is equal to j, whereas sigma composed with sigma inverse should always be the identity map. It's not because i maps to j and we're also assuming that i is not equal to j. So that we have a contradiction and we conclude that our assumption was wrong and sigma, sigma are either not disjoint or sigma, sig, or sigma rather, is equal to the identity mapping. All right, now for part two. Suppose that for some k in i sub n, that sigma of k is not equal to k. Then, since sigma and tau sub i are disjoint for all i in our indexing set, we have that uh, tau sub i of k is equal to k for all i. Thus, the product of all the tau sub i's, just the composition, right? Evaluated at k is equal to tau sub 1 of tau sub 2 of etc. all the way up to tau sub um, i max <laughs> of k is going to be equal to, this one's going to map it to k, then it's going to be the input of the next one, and etc. 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 is equal to k. Thus, we are halfway to showing that these two things are disjoint. All right, now let's go the other way. Suppose that the product um, of the tau sub i's uh, evaluated at k is not equal to k. Can we show that sigma of k is equal to k? Well, here's how we're gonna do it. Well, there has to be at least one uh, we'll call it tau sub j. There exists tau sub j such that tau sub j of k is not equal to k. Why is this true? Because if not, then they would all just map k to k and so that the product would map k to k. But we assume that was not true, so there has to be at least one of the constituent maps which doesn't map k to itself. This means that uh, for this tau sub j, since we assumed that all tau sub i and sigma were disjoint, we have that tau sub j of k is not equal to k implies that sigma of k is equal to k. So thus the product of not mapping k to k implies k, uh, sigma does map k to k, and so we have it in both directions and we conclude that sigma and our product of the tau sub i's are indeed disjoint, and our lemma is complete. All right, next theorem. The order of a permutation sigma is the least common multiple of the orders of its disjoint cycles. So now that we know that it can be broken down into disjoint cycles, there's also a relation 
between these disjoint cycles. Um, as group elements, they have an order, and the order of the permutation that they multiply to. Namely, it's the LCM. All right, you ready for this proof? So let sigma be equal to sigma one times sigma two, all the way up to sigma k, where each of these is a k cycle, since we know it can be written as a product of disjoint k cycles, or I shouldn't use k in this case, we'll say m cycles, um, since k is being used for something else here. But we have uh, sigma i all disjoint, mutually disjoint, So, now we know, since disjoint cycles commute, we know that sigma to the m is equal to sigma 1, like that. But once you, you know, you could write this as sigma 1 to the k times sigma 1 to sigma k, you know, etc. m times. But since disjoint cycles commute, we can just write this as sigma 1 to the m, sigma 2 to the m. To sigma k to the m, or we can write it as sigma 1 to the m times sigma 2 to sigma k to the m. Because they commute, we can write it in any order we want. And this is going to be a particularly useful order to write our disjoint cycles in, which we will see in just a moment. It's worth noting here that we have in fact already used the previous lemma, specifically part 2. So not only are we using commutativity, but we're also um, assuming that because sigma i and sigma j are disjoint, sigma i and sigma j to the m are disjoint, and thus also sigma i to the m and sigma j to the m are disjoint. So repeated application of the second part of our lemma is going to be used frequently here. Now let's assume that sigma to the m is equal to the identity permutation. Then what happens? Well, then we have to have sigma 1 to the m times sigma 2 to sigma k to the m is equal to the identity, and thus these two are inverses of one another, so that we can say sigma 1 to the m is equal to sigma 2 to sigma k to the negative m, or if you like, to the m to the negative 1. That, this is the inverse of this element. Now, however, by repeated application of the lemma, part two, we know that these are actually, actually disjoint. So if they're disjoint inverses, we know by part one of the lemma that in fact, one of them, or in fact, both of them are equal to the identity element. So that we have sigma one to the m is equal to the identity permutation. Now, likewise, we're going to use induction here so that if we have 1 is less than or equal to r is less than or equal to k minus 2 and we know that sigma 1 to the m, sigma 2 to the m, all the way up to sigma sub r to the m are all equal to the identity permutation while sigma sub r plus 1 to the m times all the way up to sigma sub k to the m is equal to the identity as well, then this is going to imply by the same process we did before that if we, if we factor this as sigma sub r plus 1 to the m times uh, sigma sub r plus 2 to the m, or rather uh, we could do well exactly what we did before because of the commutativity, we can write this as that to the m inverse, um, or rather, sorry, like that. But this implies that this is equal to that inverse. And we can make the same conclusions. It implies the next step. So that sigma, therefore, sigma sub r, r plus 1 to the m is equal to the identity, and sigma sub r plus 2 to the m sigma to the k to the m is equal to the identity. So we already showed the base case and now we're showing that this being true for r, uh, namely that this relationship holds that those are all equal to the identity and that this is equal to the identity implies that it's true for r plus 1. And like I said, we already covered the base case, so by induction this is going to give us that sigma 
sub 1 to the m is equal to sigma sub 2 to the m is equal to etc is equal to um, sigma sub k to the m is equal to the identity and this is all just assuming one thing which is that the uh, the product permutation sigma repeated m times is equal to the identity permutation so assuming this we get all of these also it's worth pointing out clearly if all of the if this last statement is true and all of these to the m power is equal to the identity permutation then it clearly their product is also going to be equal to the identity permutation when you raise it to the power m so it is a biconditional it goes both ways if and only if uh, and we get what we want so now we can finally figure out the order all right now just to recap sigma to the m is equal to the identity permutation and this implies that sigma i the constituent disjoint cycles also have this property for all i now re recall from the properties of cyclic subgroups that for any m for which this is true the order of sigma i must divide the number m now since the order of sigma is by definition Again, we're also talking about a cyclic subgroup here generated by the product permutation sigma. <clears throat> the order of sigma is by definition the least such m for which this is true. So we're looking at the least such m such that all of these divide m, which is going to be the least common multiple of <clears throat> the order of sigma 1, the order of sigma 2, all the way up to the order of sigma k. And we have our theorem as we desired. Theorem, every permutation in the symmetric group on n symbols can be written as a product of transpositions, though not necessarily disjoint transpositions. All right, the proof is pretty simple here. We only need to show that every k cycle can be written as a product of transpositions because every permutation we already showed can be written as a product of k cycles. So transitively, if we show that each k cycle can be broken down into two cycles, then all permutations can be broken down into two cycles. With one notable exception, we have to handle the identity case separately. So real quick, the identity we can always write as just i1 i2 times i2 i1 for two random elements so you can write the identity as a product of transpositions as well so now that that's out of the way all right now suppose that you know i sub j for all j uh is uh is in uh one two to n right so there are elements of this set and we're going to use our original notation here for cycles i1 i2 i3 all the way up to i sub k and we want to know how can we write this k cycle as a product of transpositions we're going to do it as follows which takes a little bit of inspiration but once you get it you get it i1 times i k times or rather just i1 ik times i1 ik minus 1 times i1 ik minus 2 all the way down to i1 times i2 will be our last transposition all right so the first transposition is going to switch i sub 1 and i sub k so what we get is i sub k i sub 2 i sub 3 etc i sub k minus 2 a sub k minus 1 and i sub 1 the second one is going to switch i sub 1 and i sub k minus 1 so we have i sub k i sub 2 i sub 3 etc i sub 1 i sub k minus 1 then the third one is going to switch i sub 1 and i sub k minus 2 so we get i sub k i sub 2 i sub 3 i sub 1 i sub k minus 2 i sub k minus 1 
All right, and we can continue this until our final one should look like I sub K, I sub one, I sub two, I sub three, blah, 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 all the way up to I sub K minus two, I sub K minus one. And if you'll notice, this is exactly a cycle of length K. So we started with I one all the way up to I K, and we sent I one to I two, right? To now it's in position two, I two to I three. Again, it's in position three all the way until we get to I sub K, which goes back to position of I sub one. And indeed it is at the beginning. So you see that this really is the K cycle, which we call I sub one, I sub two, I sub three, all the way up to I sub K in parentheses. It can indeed be written as a transposition. We did it constructively. We showed an exact formula for it in terms of our product of transpositions. And so it's going to work for any cycle. And because any permutation can be broken down into K cycles, we now have shown uh, transitively that every permutation can be written as a product of two cycles or transpositions. All right, so I realized after making this that there's way too much footage for one video here. So we're going to be splitting this into two, two different videos about the symmetric group, part one and part two. And it's really a good place to break anyway because we're going to change perspectives next time. So, so far we've pretty much taken a strictly group theoretic point of view in looking at the symmetric group and permutations in general. Next time we're going to examine a powerful idea and apply it to the symmetric group. Namely, studying a group from the point of view of a matrix representation of that group. So, be looking forward to that.